much to you. But for those of us who have peered into, you know, it's like when, uh, when Moses stood before God and you know, he said, I can't do it. I'm not, you know, I'm not able to preach and I can't lead the people out and everything. He says, well, take your hand and stick it inside your bosom. He says, okay. And he says, now pull it out. And it was leprous. He said, look, you're way worse than you think you are. You know what I mean? So now stick it back in. Now pull it out. It was clean. That's the Lord. See? But we need to see. I mean, it, it really, you know, the, the meaning of the cross doesn't mean a lot if you think you're a pretty good person. But it means an awful lot to those who have given up on themselves and said, man, without Jesus, I am nothing. And they're not, it's not just words. It is the truth of the truth of the truth to that person. And they are eternally grateful. And, you know, I've often wondered, how, how does people stand before the throne throughout all eternity and worship the Lamb. I mean, you know, I, after a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm going to be tired of heaven. You know? Ah, a couple of weeks, you know, I'm hoarse, I'm tired. You know, where's that mansion? You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm going to the bunkhouse, man. You know? <laughs> you know, but the truth is, man, there is the, this eternal praise, this eternal um, jubilation, scream in one sense because you just are so thankful that you have come into Christ, that you've found Him, He's found you, that you have been brought into something that you didn't deserve, you'll never deserve it, and it has transformed you. And you just, you know... And nobody can understand your heart. I mean, they can hear your words and stuff like that. But for you, it keeps you, you don't wear out. You don't, you know, the new doesn't wear off. You just love the Lord and you'll always love the Lord because there's nothing else that can ever take His place. Nothing. Nothing can take the place of Jesus. You know. And so, um, these, you know, these realities that we shared in the last class are so glorious, but no matter how glorious they are, they mean very little until you've been brought to a place like what we're describing. But when, you, but when you've been brought there, they just become everything. They are life evermore. They are eternal life to you. And you never, ever, 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 ever think of existence apart from these things. Because they, they are your lifeline, they're your hope, they are your way out of you. I mean, you know, I don't, there's just not enough words to describe such glories that are the Lord. Anyway, we were talking basically about tests of leadership and different things that people go through. And the whole thing of last class was getting us into this reality that, hey, you're going to face some things. And part of the reason is to develop Christ in you and to develop the character of Christ and the nature of Christ in you because. It is not about doing. It is not about ministry. It is not about what's coming up. It's not about uh, having a happy family or a Christian family or a, on and on and on. I mean, this nation is full of Christian families, and yet this nation is a mess. Now that, that, it should not be that way, folks. Jesus is more of an impact than that. Amen? Yeah. So the problem is Christianity is not the answer. Christ is the answer. And when Christians begin to be changed into the image of Christ, we'll begin to see major changes happen in our country. And until, until we lay down our religion for a person, it's just going to continue the way it is. So, part of the development of that is, is that God has to prove certain things in you. They have to be proven. Uh, for example, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, God creates them. Perfect environment, no devil, no tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If, if he just didn't put one there, and he walks up to Adam and says, "Adam, do you love me?" Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Are you grateful for the garden here? Oh, yeah. well, you wouldn't go with the devil the first time he showed up, would you? Oh. <laughs> 
And in, and in his, don't you think that if God actually did that, that in his heart he would be as, as sincere as Peter was? He said, I will not deny you. I will die first. And when he saw he was going to die, he said, no, no, I don't even know the guy. And cussed so that they could say, well, he's not one of his. You know? No, there has to be a test. So put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in. Put the devil in there. Boom, bop, bop. It's all over with. So we have to be tested. In other words, you are not what you believe. You are not, you are what you have been tested on and proven. Battle tested. Battle tested is, you know, it's like uh, some of the uh, uh, troops that were in Afghanistan. There were some guys that we sent in there who were in the Gulf War. They'd been battle tested. They'd worked tanks against an enemy. They'd fought. They'd done this and that. And then there were some people who'd never seen battle. Well, trust me, I was in the Army during the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, again, these movies are a real joke because uh, you have uh, all these older people. You know, I was 18. My best friend was 17. And everybody around me was 17, 18, or 19 when I was in the Army. Okay, everybody was there. I was telling them. Uh, ben, that I was three years younger than he was, and I was a sergeant in the army. Three years younger than Ben, and I was a sergeant in the army. And uh, you know, you, you got the kids who just came off the streets, and I mean, they don't know anything. You know, they're not battle tested. And so, one of the things that they do is they put you through tests. I mean, it's not all just training; it's testing. And one of the things they do is. One night they take you out and they have this battlefield and I mean they got bombs going off and they got machine guns shooting over your head and they got bob wire that you have to work through and you're supposed to work through this thing with all those <coughs> and then all of a sudden you know smoke bombs come over the thing and you can't see where you're going and then the next phase you get through and a smoke bomb comes but they don't tell you that, that it's got gas in it and gas hits you and you know you've got a gas mask but you've got <coughs> you got to you know, and, and still it's in your eyes, and your eyes are burning and everything, and, you're, oh, yeah, and people jump up, and they get hit, caught in the wire, you know what I mean, the bob wire and everything, and, you know, and that's just a test. That's not even a real thing, you know. When you see people blown up all around you, and the wind is flying in every direction and everything, and stuff like that, you know, you don't know. You don't know what you're going to do, and I'm not just talking about war. I'm talking about the real war. Talking about the enemy hitting you and blowing bombs up all around you and you know destroying everything all around you and how, what are you going to do? Well, I know what we think we're going to do. Oh, I'll be a hero for Jesus. I will be a hero for Jesus. Yes, sir. I'm going to be something special for God. You know, I I haven't told this story in a hundred years, but I will tell this story. Part of the training that we had was grenade training, and some of the Early people have heard this, but most of them haven't. I don't think. It's grenade training. We were on these these risers, these benches, and and uh, what they did was they had uh, these bunker things where you threw the grenade over this bunker and it would explode. And everybody was supposed to throw the grenade and get a feel of how to throw a grenade. You pull the pin, pull the pin, go back like this, wait for a second, and then you lob it over the bunker and everything. And so. The guy, the sergeant comes out, he's training us for grenade drills, comes out, and he says, okay, you know, everybody's going to get an opportunity to do this, and I was, I was like on about the fourth row in these bleachers, you know, they go up like this, and they were kind of a little circular thing, you know, probably about 100, 200 of us there, and he said, uh, but, you know, I need somebody that can, uh, I'm going to help demonstrate this, and I'll put my arm around him and help do it and everything. He pulled his uh, sergeant, the guy that, that controls our group, because he was an instructor just for everybody. So he asked our sergeant, well, let me see your roster. He goes, uh, let's say Private Luckett. Well, Private Luckett was the worst guy in the group. He couldn't chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. It was, we always went, no! <laughs> no! <laughs> guy and he's right there in front of us, you know. And so I said, okay, Lucky, come in here, Lucky. 
not just to the mission field, but to Jamaica, not just to a small island, but to way off in the bush where there was nothing. And I became a teacher of school children, of orphans. We had an orphanage and a little school for, for little kids there. And, you know, the man with the great revelation of Christ was put on an island far from anything and everybody. Way back up the woods. And I'm telling you that Randy went through some of it. You should have sent me to New York City. You know, you know, you know I mean, you, you, you just think that, you know? I mean, you really do. You're thinking, man, I mean, somebody like me, you could really use me, you know? And of course, the Lord's thinking, I can't use you at all right now. You know, you've seen some things, but you haven't been tested. So let's see how you handle obscurity. Being put away, and it's as if nobody knows you're alive. And you're just kind of going, it's all a waste. My life's a waste. All the teaching, all the revelation, it's a waste. Is it a waste? Well, it depends on how you respond. Amen. And so then the Lord began to deal with me. If you can't be happy here, if you have to be seen by people, then you've got a real problem. Amen. Amen. You, uh, you got to be in the forefront, and there's, then, then you've got a problem, and I really can't use you the way that you, you need to be used. And then I realized this is part of the training. This is important. This is not only important that I go, okay, I'm going to do my time on the island, and then I'll hit the main. You understand what I'm saying? No, 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 no. I realized, man, God's got to work some things in me. And I needed it worked in me because I didn't have that attitude. I didn't have that spirit. I didn't, you know, it wasn't okay. But God began to work it in me. And then it began to be, hey, it's okay. It's okay. I don't have to have this or I don't have to do this or I don't have to be seen or, you know. And my zeal and my love for the Lord said, when I get out of Bible school, man, I'm just going to take the world for Jesus. My God, it's, the world will never be the same after I hit this place. Well, that's true, but it wasn't exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really had delusions of grandeur, can I put it like that? Really, I mean, I did. I mean, if there was going to be such a shaking of everything. And the Lord just basically spoke to me and said, I really don't want you shaking anything, okay? It's, it's, remember Paul, when he first got saved? He went around and shook a bunch of stuff too, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, do you remember? I mean, it was a mess. Everywhere he went, it stirred up trouble. And it says, finally, they shipped him out to Tarsus, and it says, then they had peace in all the churches. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mr. Hotshot Apostle. The best thing to do for you is get you out of town, get you away from the churches for a while, and let you grow up a little bit, you know, and be proven. And so the Lord was saying basically the same thing for me, man. Just, you know, uh, the, the, the answer for obscurity is faith. Faith that God knows where you're at. God knows where you're at. God knows you. He knows your heart. He knows your love. He knows your abilities. He knows the level of revelation that's true that can help people. He knows all of that. The main thing for you to do is not to think of yourself, but think in terms of Him. He's faithful. I trust Him. I'm not worried. And, and what happens in you is you begin to get to a place where you, if, if God can really work in you, that you say, Lord, I'm your servant, and if you choose not to use this vessel hardly at all, then that's your will, and I should be happy with your will because I claim to be your vessel and your servant. You see what I mean? And so what happens is he begins to work in you to the degree that you go, you know, it doesn't matter. I just want the Lord to be happy. And then you actually start praying for other people that possibly would be in the place that you wanted to be in. You, start, you may not even know their names or who they are or where they're at, but you start praying, oh, Lord, use them. And Lord, use them in a grand way and bless your kingdom. And da 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 you know? And then if you hear a story back, instead of going, I wanted to be that one, you go, Lord, thank you. I know that you're hearing my prayers too, and we're all working in concert to bring forth your glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
And then there's a joy. There's a joy because you're part of a bigger picture. You're part of something bigger than your little life and your little ministry and your little what you what you know. I mean, it's like, well, Lord, look at all I have to offer. And doesn't the Lord have to deal with all the stuff we try to offer? We already talked about that in the last class, but you know, He has to show us that we really don't have anything to offer until we have the offering that is without spot or blemish, which is Christ, and we offer Him a. And there is that sweet Savior when that begins to happen. And all of our sacrifices that come from us have blemishes, whether we spot them or not. You know, they have blemishes. And so that obscurity thing uh, is pretty strong. Let's see, I wrote a few little notes here. What is needed, let's see, to maintain vision in the face of, of doubts, that especially, and when you're in an obscure place, it's... Um, the thoughts can come, well, I guess, like Abraham, I guess I'm going to fail in carrying out the vision that God gave me. And you can actually have a God-given vision and then God send you in the opposite direction of that. And part of that is that test to see if you're going to trust the Lord. You know, remember what he said to Habakkuk? Wait on the vision. It will tarry, but it will come. So don't be in a hurry. Don't get up and rush out and try to produce something to additional uh, that's, that's just going to cause more problems. Just be patient. Be still and know that I'm in control. I see it all. And, and um, some of the things that the Lord, and I'm just trying to share, you know, there's so much beyond what I've seen, obviously, but, you know, since I'm up here teaching, is that you just... You, you just realize that if God, if he can clear all the junk out of me and it takes 85 years and then I die at 88, the three good years that are pure Christ are better than 50 years that was me. You know? So then you kind of go, you know, that don't sound so bad. You know, and that, that, in the early days, that sounded horrible to me. There was a day that, you know, you remember the scripture about, uh, uh, and Jesus said, some bringeth forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. Oh, you remember that? Let me tell you, for half of my ministry, bless God, I'm a 100-fold Christian. I know that sounds terrible, but I mean, that was my attitude. I'm a hundredfold Christian, and I'm going to bring forth a hundredfold. I'm going to all the way, all out for God, everything and every manner, nothing, you know, everything's done and done. And I'm in it. I'm just, I didn't, it wasn't all just pride, although you better believe there's, you know, there's you mixed into all that. Trust me. There's you mixed in me, you know, my flesh, my ideas, my, you know. And, you know, hundredfold, and, and I had so settled it in me. One day I realized God may only be able to get 30 fold out of me. And that was like, I remember it was a huge devastation in my life that I'm not going to be a hundred fold Christian. That I've got flaws and stuff that's going to render that down to possibly 30 fold. And then the Lord let me chew on that for a long time and came back and, you know, the Lord's something, didn't he? <laughs> he really is. You know, and then he came back later and said, you know, Jesus said there's some that fell beside the wayside, there's some that fell here. And then he said there's good ground, some 30, some 60, some 100. He didn't make any difference for 30, 60, and 100. He just called it all good ground. What did he get? I mean, think about that. And then, and there actually came a time in my life when I thought, if he could get 30 fold out of me, I would just be so happy. <laughs> oh, man, please, Lord. Let me at least get him to 30 fold. You know? I mean, the Lord puts you through some stuff. You know? and, he, and he's got to tear down before he can build up. You know? And then I came to the realization that that measurement isn't even something that I can even measure properly. You know what I'm talking about? I can't measure. I don't know if I'm 30, 60, or 100, or 10 percent, or you know, I may be, I may be 10 percent milk or something. You know, I, mean? I, you know I, mean? so, I don't know. 
I mean, I don't know. He knows. My job is not to know. My job is not to look at me and measure. My job is to look at him who is the measure. And you do, you'll do a lot better when you keep your eyes off yourself. When you think you're doing good or when you think you're doing bad. Just turn your eyes on Jesus and say, Jesus, you're my everything. You're my hope. You're my way. You're my truth. You're everything. I love you. I want you. And you just do that. You, just, you know what? Because if you don't, you're not going to keep going. You'll either go off in your own way, in your own pride and everything, which God forbid that any of us do that, but we do some of the time until he gets hold of it. Or you'll fall down in a heap and just go, well, I'm not worth anything that I can't do. And that's the truth. We're not worth anything and we can't do it until Christ begins to come forth. The answer is not, I'm not worth anything and I can't do it. The answer is, I need to quit looking at me. And if you look at Jesus, then no matter how bad you failed or anything you've done wrong, you will pick up and you'll keep going. Praise God, just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just go. You don't have, you know, you may not be able to run, but go. You know, I remember Arthur Blessing said, the guy that carried the cross around the world and everything, and just something that he touched my heart. He said, you know, if Jesus was in New York and he said, go to New York, you know, he said, man, I'm going to go to Jesus. He said, I'm going to walk. And he says, I'm going to, you know, if I get tired and I fall down, I'm going to start crawling in the direction of New York because Jesus is there. And he says, and then I'll just claw my way. And he says, finally, if I can't make it and I just die, I will die with my finger pointing in the direction of New York. <laughs> and I said, yeah. You know, just go for the Lord as much as you can and but you will be overwhelmed by looking at yourself. So look at Jesus. You will. You will feel quit. All right. The next one is the test of menial tasks. Anybody want to tell me what a menial <laughs> task is? Anybody got a definition? Greg? Probably the worst thing you can think of that you guess me to do. Fear factor? Is that what you said? No, what did you say? The worst thing you could think of? The worst thing possible, dreadful thing you can think of asking anybody asking you to do. Okay. Unimportant. Joseph. How are you? Sleeping on the floor. Sleeping on the floor. The toilets. As Sleep opposed to, as opposed to, let's say, going out and preaching an evangelistic crusade. I mean, I mean, I know what we're talking about. What, what Unimportant. Unimportant things. Boring. Boring is a good one. Time-consuming, trivial things. Time-consuming, trivial things. Anybody else? Unspiritual. Unspiritual. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Amen. Very good. Anybody else? Well, that's the we're talking about the, the perception. Amen. We're talking about the perception. We know better, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we know better. All right. Um what is needed to pass this test? The other one, man, we needed faith. This one, this one we need endurance. And all of these are Christ. And man, Christ the one need you. Endurance. Endurance is a good thing to have, folks. I mean, look at Wyman. Look at the longevity. Look at Kathy. Look at the endurance. And I tell you, without endurance, I don't care how good you are. You're a, you're a uh, what did uh, Jude in the book of Jude? I mean, they're, they're, they're wandering stars. They are, you know, I just, I just see this falling star, you know. Woo, that was great, but I mean, it's like that. It's gone. Woo, and then you'll live your life. Well, without water. Well, without water and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it looks pretty good for a moment, but then it's over with. You know, but endurance. And I remember when I was young and I was going to be the one, I was the hundredfold guy, I remember saying, bless God, I am not going to rust out, I'm going to burn out. <laughs> I said stuff like that, folks. I was an idiot. <laughs> I am not going to rust out. I'm going to burn it. And now, there's a truth to that, so don't misunderstand me. But I mean, you know, my mind was, yeah, you know, and I came close to burning out. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't want to rust out in the sense that, you know, I'm the tin man that doesn't move for so long and the rain falls on you. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you never saw the Wizard of Oz. 
That's about all he had left. You know what? Oil can in your, you know. <laughs> My point is, <laughs> is that, you know, yeah, there's a truth of, you know, just sitting still and not doing anything, and I'm, I'm not going to rust out. But I'm not going to burn out any, uh, uh, something hit me after some years rolled by that, you know what, this is not a race in that sense, it's a marathon. And in a marathon, you don't, here's, you don't start the marathon like this. <laughs> now, if you've ever watched on TV the Boston Marathon, anybody ever seen it? Yeah. Oh man! You know they got the they got the video cameras there, and the race starts, and here's the line. You know the race starts, boom! And of course they got thousands of people going across the bridge there and everything, and here they come on, and they're going like this, and they're running that way with the camera, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby. You know, it's so good to get that picture. I tell you what, you get towards the end of the race. And, I mean, it's like, and everything's pulling, saying, stop, fall down. And, uh, uh, and then the camera, and they're like, going, oh, there's a camera. They can't pull any of that out. I said, I've got to go. My legs don't want to move. I've got to go. All of the fun little cutesy stuff is gone, you know? It's all over with. And that's the way it is in Christ, folks, I'm telling you. You, you, you realize if I don't pace myself, I'm going down. <laughs> really? You know, and especially if you're one of these wild, crazy ones that, you know, it's like, like I was. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what it said to Paul. I was out distancing all of my brothers. Remember that? That's I'm getting tired of doing it. That's why I pissed myself. I pissed myself in my my uh, preaching. Yes, the Lord give it. I'm gonna take it away. Anyway. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate Texas girls so much. <laughs> Somebody has won, like yeah. many races, it's really not over with, is it? Yeah. For many of the people who continue to go through, it never really was first and foremost about winning, it was about finishing the race. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's a great <clears throat> All right, so menial tasks, and, and let me just tell you this. This is a test, and God will put you in, you, you, you love Jesus, you want to do great things for Jesus, there's no question about that, 
But God is going to put you in situations of menial things that you are going to say, I shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, this is dumb. I could be really doing something great for the Lord right now. Amen? I just remembered, and I guess this is story now, but I remembered a story when I was in Brian Bible School that was, it was very similar to the way we do in that we, you know, have tasks and stuff like that. And so we called off classes in the afternoon and, and everybody was given different assignments. And mine and this friend of mine's task was to, we had wooden desks, not like these that they were, well, we see any of them, they were wooden desks with wooden tops and everything. And, and our job was to sit in this classroom and sand these desks down, okay? Well, it just so happened that the guy that I was in the room with was a real Bible guy like me, and, you know, we just shared the word all the time. <clears throat> so, you know, I carried my little Bible here, and he carried his Bible in his hip pocket and everything. So, so we sit down, of course, and then we're standing there. We start off, and we're sanding away on the desktop, right? We're sanding, and we're sanding, and we're talking, and so we start sharing the word and everything, and so we're, we're sharing everything, and, and pretty soon we're sitting we're both sitting in the desk standing, you know. And then, as we're sharing the word, one goes, oh, let me show you, and pulls out the Bible. So he's standing like this, and he's sharing with me like this. And I say, yeah, well, look what the Lord showed me. And now we both, on one hand, standing, and the other one's on the Bible. And pretty soon, then, oh, look. And then we quit standing, and we're just sitting there talking, and we're just going back and forth. And oh, the glory that filled the room. <laughs> <laughs> the, dir <laughs> the director, Charles Farnsworth, Sticks his head in. What are you guys doing? This is the time we're all working together as a body. This is, you know, you're not supposed to be sharing the word. This is the time to be working on these desks and everything. We said, well, you know, the Lord was just, you know, they're coming down and everything. And we couldn't help it. It wasn't us. It was God. And, you know, and, uh, and so he said, if you're going to sit and share the word, you ought to just go over to the chapel. And he walks off. <laughs> We turned to each other and go, what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so we get up and go over to the chapel. Now we're going over there because we're spiritual. Because we're spiritual and we shouldn't be doing menial tasks. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, oh, that's not the Lord. We should be over in the chapel with the Lord. All right, so we enter into the chapel. It's during the day, so the lights are kind of low in there because everybody's all over campus doing other stuff and working with the Lord and everything. And so we, we're in there, and so we get in the chapel, and man, you know, we sit down in the pew, and we start reading, and we're not sharing now. We start reading. Pretty soon we lay down on the pew, and pretty soon we're both sound asleep. Real spiritual. Real spiritual. Now, if we were so spiritual, what are we doing sleeping? I mean, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if we're so dedicated to the Lord, <laughs> yeah, that's my point. You say, well, of course, uh, I can forget this part exactly how it comes. But anyway, the, the next thing is, is I think we were woke up by Charles Farnsworth or somebody that he sent, and we brought before him, and, and we had missed dinner time. And, of course, this was a body thing, more so than even here. So, you know, when you missed, everybody knew that you were gone and stuff like that. Where have you guys been? Well, we went over to the chapel, like you said. I didn't mean go to the chapel. Well, you said, you know, if you're going to... What I meant was, what I hoped that you would get was that, you know... <laughs> anyway. So, just so you know, you know... Um, sometimes things get worse before they get better. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever notice that? Mm -hmm. I remember the story of the demoniac when, when Jesus came up and there was this boy and he had demons and stuff like that. And the demons were manifesting and everything, you know, and Jesus walks up and goes, We tried to cast the demons out, we couldn't cast it out. What are we going to do? This is a crazy situation. And oh my God, we, we killed your disciples and your disciples couldn't cast them out. What are we going to do? So Jesus shows up. We go, yay, Jesus showed up. So it says, Jesus rebuked the demons and come out and fell spirit. When he did, the kid fell down as though dead. And so much so that some around him said, he is dead. Now can you imagine being a parent? Oh my God. 
God, he was vomiting and throwing up and carrying on. But at least he was alive. <laughs> right? Now he's dead. You know? And that just, the Lord showed me that years ago and said, you know, sometimes when we bring Jesus on the thing, scene, we think that's going to make everything better. And sometimes they get worse. And we need to trust that the Lord is still the Lord. We need to not go by what we see. Go by what we consider worse than circumstances and believe that if I pray, then God's on the move. I don't care how bad it looks. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm telling you, you can't go by. You cannot walk by sight. You can't. You should. I pray. I believe. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm not. The devil uses that stuff. You're on call of mind. I'll play tricks on you and say, well, I guess God didn't do it. You know what I mean? But if you believe, then you shouldn't surrender so quickly. Uh, I remember the situation when uh, Israel was in Egypt. They'd been down there for how many years? Hundreds of years? 400? 400 years. That's a long time to be making straw bricks for Pharaoh. So the deliverer comes. Amen? Moses. Man of God. Man of power. Man of faith. Shows up. Stands before Pharaoh. God sent me here. Almighty God has sent me. Let my people go. Says all this stuff. And what was Pharaoh's response? That's it. That's it. Hey, we ain't putting up with this stuff. From now on, he talked to his captain of his guard. You tell those guys, from now on, they're going to work twice the hours, and I'm not even going to give them straw to make their bricks from. They're going to have to make without that from now on. The situation got way worse. So much so that they came to Moses, and they wanted to kill him. Look, dude, our lives were miserable enough till you showed up. Now it's really bad. And you as a leader or as somebody sent of God or supposed to be following God, you will, you're under the test of worsening conditions. Did God send me or not send me? Did I say what I was supposed to? And here's I mean, this is the kind of stuff you go through. Did God send me or not? You'll have to work it, blah, 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 you know, or I don't know, well, maybe he didn't. You know, this, this kind of stuff comes up and it actually has a real power. Well, maybe he didn't send me. Well, you need to know if God sent you. Yeah. And then, well, maybe I didn't say it right. I know God sent me. Maybe I didn't say it right. You know, maybe I should have just smacked him with the rod across his mouth. But I mean, I don't know. What, maybe I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't get the right result. Everything went, they didn't just get better. They got worse. And these are important things. You will be tested. You will be. You're not going to be. I mean, you, possibly, you will be tested. You need to know. First of all, that's why it's important to clear all the junk out of your life and throw it out of the boat. So the more baggage you got in that boat, then every time the devil says something, you go, he's got a reason because you go, well, there's this, you know, and I allow that. Well, there's this too. You know, he's got a lot of stuff. And none of that's the real deal. God's testing you by getting worse than conditions, not based on your failures or anything you've done. This whole thing's by grace. Amen? But, it opens the door for doubt and fear in your own mind because you've allowed this and you've done this and that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm telling you. And again, it may not be based on any of that, but that's an open door to your mind that can question. The devil says, oh, what about this deal? And God says, oh, it's something you didn't go with. And you start freaking out. And then you say, okay, well, I failed it. So, so God wanted to deliver Israel by my hand, but now he's not going to do it. And I failed the time before when I was Pharaoh's son, and you know, and I went out and killed that Egyptian. Now I come back and I failed again, and it just proves I can't do it and walk off. You've failed the test of worsening conditions. Things are, let me tell you, things can be really bad and get worse. I know that some of you are so preciously innocent. <laughs> You're so preciously innocent. You have no clue that things can be really bad and then get worse. You just don't know. And 
I wish my innocence had been taken away, but it's been taken away. Things can be horribly bad and get worse. And that's where there's a place in Christ where you separate from everything else and you are one with the Lord by faith and by His grace and by what He has done and what the cross and, uh, has done and, and the resurrection and it has nothing to do with you. And you must separate from you or you will faint in the way. It's tough. It is tough. And the enemy, just like a war, just like a, an army that, that is at your gates, and you know, they're all taking the big tree that they cut down and ramming your gate with the thing. Ah, boom! Oh, man! And you know what you're thinking? If they hit me four more times, I'm going to cave. Huh? I mean... You know, and then boom, three more times. And you know what I mean? You're just, you're just going, oh my God, I can't, I, I don't think I can hold up. I don't think I can make it. And the truth is, man, it gets tough. But God will, if you let him, he will move you to a place that is unlike the one that you're at right now. Can you at least believe that there is such a place at this early stage in your walk? Just believe there is such a place. And it, is, it ends up being a beautiful place. You're, you become thankful that there is such a place because when everything's shaking and you, you realize, man, everything that I've worked for and everything is about to cave in around me and, you know, and I'm going to be drug out and hung. And that's going to be my legacy. A dirty dog hung out, you know, by a hangman's name. Something deep within you, if you will allow it, will recognize the worsening conditions and your inability to hold on, and your eyes will lift up in a whole new way, and you'll find Jesus rich and real in the yeah. deepest direction. Yeah. In the deepest direction. Right? Yeah. And, it's, and it's better than you could have imagined before. Yeah. You find the Lord in a way that you you only played at it. I mean, it feels like that. You were only playing at it before you got to this place. And you're so thankful because it builds a, a foundation and a stability in you that is above the movement of things, the shaking of things. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't just say the earth will be sure. Yay, the Lord says one more time, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. And all the things that you held as true from the heavens will be shook. And you'll bow. Up and down. But there's something not based on your believing in the heavens or your belief of the heavens. There is Christ. And he's like a solid rock on the inside of you from the top to bottom. And everything in you might be shook. But you feel something in you that is not you, that is strong. And you go, this is, I'm strong in the Lord. I don't know. I am a weak piece of jello without the Lord. And the contrast of these worsening conditions really is a, an amazing thing because you see that if the rod of God was not in you, the life of Christ was not a steel rod within you, you really see that you would be just shattered to bits. I mean, you see that I, I'm really nothing. But all of a sudden, man, you are aware of a strength beyond you. You are aware, and when and when you should just shake to death, you are peaceful in the middle of a storm. And you are confident with nothing. Nothing that gave you confidence. All of those things that gave you confidence have been removed. And now your confidence is stricter than the Lord that's real. Man, those places, I don't, you know what the truth is? I don't want anybody to have to go to those places. But there's a good chance we'll all go there. If we're going to be anything for God, we're going to have to be able to survive worsening conditions. That's the, I make sure I wrote everything down here. But, uh, I said, no defeat is final. And this is something that you, you you ought to let it just kind of sink into you right now. We worry about defeats, but you can even go into death and there's still hope because
is his resurrection. His resurrection. And I'm going to just tell you this. Believe in resurrection. Believe in Really believe in Believe in resurrection. Believe that no matter what the enemy, the world, or, or your own failures, or anybody else can, how dark they can sink you, if you are one with the Lord, believe in resurrection. There is life out of death. So because of resurrection, because there is life out of death, no defeat is final. Now, if you've not brought to death, I mean, the Lord had to talk to me, and he said, you know what, Randy, if there's a prize fight, and if it's 15 rounds, 15 rounds, 15 rounds, and you get out there, you know, and you're out there with Mike Tyson, and first round, he bites your ear off. <laughs> Second round, he takes your nose off. The third round, he just punches you the whole time. Fourth round, you're walking out and they can't hit you because you're so, you know. And you're thinking, my God, my God, 15 rounds, I ain't going to make it through five. You know? And bam, And every round, he just whips the fire out of you until the 15th round, and you're standing there, and all of a sudden, the Lord gives you the strength. And bam, you hit him, and he goes down, and they lift your hand and say, the winner! Huh. It doesn't matter what happened before. Nobody walks up and goes, no, you won. You knocked him out in the 15th round. It didn't matter how bad you were in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. You understand? That's the way it works. And I've seen, I have, man, I've been in, in spiritual fights. And I was losing, you know. I mean, I'm walking out going, you know, it's the old saying of, you know, the guy's out there and he's being all beat up and he sits down in the corner and he's, Manager's going, man, you're doing good. You know, he ain't laying a glove on you. You're really getting him and everything. He says, and he says, he ain't laying a glove on me. He says, you know, no, man, you're doing great. He he's not even touching you. And he says, well, then you better watch the ref because somebody's beating the fool out of you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what you feel like. I mean, you're going, bam, bam. I mean, you just, and you're thinking, man, why, you know, and you're not getting the victory. Something needs to register in your mind. I don't care. This is not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Amen. And even if he hits me, and bam, and, I, ah, and my life goes out of me, and I fall to the ground, it ain't over because life comes out of death. God raises the dead. Yes. Amen. And I will just tell you that I believe that's something that has stayed with me over the years and really, really kept. I'm not just talking junk. I'm not just teaching students. I'm just, I'm trying to impart my heart. I've been saved more than once when I was losing, losing bad. But somewhere deep, you know, it wasn't in the forefront. It wasn't like walking around going, no, I know. I mean, you know, it wasn't like, I mean, because everything was hurting. And, you know, but something deep within me said, in me has given me confidence, not in the exterior, but this thing can turn at any moment. Any yeah. moment. Any moment this baby can turn. And then you put a trust in a God that you can't see and you can't feel. And then you start to touch something real, eternal. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And make sure I got all my things read here. Our spirit is not to stagger and stumble at the critical circumstances or the failures of self. To the Christian, death is not an end, for there is a God of resurrection. And so, everybody is going to face a time where things get bad and then they get worse. Nothing that I can give you outwardly will change everything outwardly when that happens because it's meant to get worse. But the, some of the things I've shared with you, if you'll you let it get on the inside of you, and just, you know, man, if I was you, if, if I was 
a young person sitting here and this and this, and it was reversed, I'd be saying, oh God, I get the feeling that I have no clue what this guy's been through or what I'm going to go through in the future. Oh Lord, I don't want this class to pass and then just be another class that I don't remember. Oh Lord, please help me to remember that the that, that there is no defeat, no defeat is final in Christ. And not even death is the end of the matter. And let me find that deep within my being so that when I face things all alone and nobody to encourage me, nobody to teach me or talk to me about these things, that something is alive within me. And it's in there, and it says, and I mean, it's, it doesn't overwhelm me. It's almost like just a still, small voice. In the 15th round, in here, one punch, and you win. This is crazy. I mean, you've been, you had the fool be that. And you're thinking, just one. Just the right one at the right place. Everybody else is laughing and mocking and saying, he's going down, look, he's staggering, he's going to go down, he can't last much longer. You're saying, I can't in myself, but boy, just one time. And it's all over. And then sometimes God does it through you. Sometimes he lets you go into death and then just raises you up. You remember, I don't know, you remember uh, in the book of Revelation with the, the two witnesses? Doing all this great powerful stuff. So what did the enemy do? Just gathered them up and killed them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. Glory to God, we killed them. We're the enemy. We've got the victory. We're more powerful. We're more powerful. When it's head to head, Satan against God, Satan wins. Well, what happens? Three days later, boom. Ah! I mean, there's no power against that sort of thing. You know what I mean? I mean, the thought comes, well, I'll kill him, I'll get up, I'll kill him, I'll get up, I'll kill him, I'll get up. <laughs> you know? If you're not careful, the thought will come in your mind, I'll get up, they kill me. I'll get up, they kill me. Anybody see the difference? One, one is it's the same exact thing happening, but you're going, but, you know, every time I get up, they kill me. Instead of every time they kill me, I get up. I'm, this isn't just talk. Folks. I'm serious. Yeah. When you get to a place where you realize, and there's nothing they can do against God, and as long as I'm going to stay with God, then God's going to win. I'm not going to win. I may not always win. I may get beat up, but God's going to win. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And your heart knits in with the Lord in a special way that pleases Him. Nobody else knows about it. Only those who have been through this valley of the shadow of death that have been in with the Lord like this, they're aware of the Lord in that special way. But most other people, only those, unless they can hear that in somebody else, and about all they can do is kind of look in their direction and give a knowing glance, and the other person goes, I sense that you know what I'm talking about. You just kind of go, you know, it's like the example I've used for years is you kind of reach up, you feel those rope burns around your neck. And I can survive, and you kind of look over there, and his collar shifts just a little bit, and he's, oh my God, look, he's been hung and kicked, and you know, he knows what I'm talking about, and he's alive to tell him. Sorry, I use all this Texas example, but I'm Texas. I mean, you, I mean, it's like you, you just get a little glimpse of those little bugs, and you go, God bless you, brother. You know, something in you rises up to them. And you can't put it into words. You can't, you don't sit down and talk about it, but you just knowingly have a fellowship of sufferings that nobody else knows about. It's just a special bond that God gives you. So, so with all of these, yeah, it sounds terrible. Oh, my God. You know? But I'm telling you that at least you're in the new heights of the Lord that is very, very, very precious. 
Father, we just thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that teaches, Lord, not, not Randy teaches, not even if it's my words, but Lord, you're speaking things to people. It's important for them. It's important. It's important. It's eternally important. It is kingdom important. And so, Lord, let these things sink down to the hearing of those that are within earshot of this. And Lord, let them realize these aren't just teachings, Lord, but as best as I can, as, as it were a father in the Lord, I would equip my children. As best I am as a leader, I would equip the saints, Lord, to be able to have the things they need when they need it, Lord. Help them to comprehend that it's not just theology. It is true equipment. And Lord, it will bring them into deeper depths of you. It will bless them for all eternity. Father, I thank you for those that so care about you, that deeply long inner courts that they never tread before. They long to embrace you in ways that others have not made. They long to touch your nail-scarred hands and look into your face and for you to be able to look back into their face and see something that has recognized something beyond just that they were needy and you died for them fellowship and, and, and sufferings that was hard to explain in human terms. Jesus, you are so beautiful and wonderful. You are everything. And you are the desire of my heart and of the hearts of many in this room. Jesus, we pour out we honor your death and your burial. We memorialize it. We, we, we're filled up with the reality, the sweetness of the union that we have with you that brings a sweetness to your nostrils because we're with you where you're at instead of you always having to be with us where we're at. So be pleased. Be blessed. May it be not because of me, but just be a sweet, sweet Savior to you. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Bless your word and bless our ears and our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're just some sort of.